Church, it's good to be with you online this morning. Uh, you'll notice that I'm at home, and that's because the most loving thing we can do is to protect the health and safety of our entire congregation and our staff by following the instructions of our leaders and staying at home. And so we're going to be doing church at home with you in this season also. Uh, these days, a lot of times people ask me how I'm doing, whether it's over text or in a conversation, and I often find myself responding similarly. I say something like, it's just crazy. This is crazy. I mean, we've all experienced times in our personal lives where our lives have been flipped upside down a little bit. Uh, sometimes it's because we've moved or maybe over the loss of a job or, or even a loved one. Um, but in this case, our entire world is experiencing this together, and it's like nothing we've ever been through before. In just a few weeks, the way that we do school and work and church and watch sports and the way we socialize, it's all changed. And I know for many of us, uh, there's a lot of different feelings around that. There's fear a fear of what's happening with the economy and what could happen with our jobs. Um, there's anger for some of us, uh, anger at what people are doing or aren't doing. Um, some of you may be annoyed at how long this could last, or, or some of you maybe are enjoying this extra time. I've heard from some of you introverts who are loving this, and so I'm very happy for you. But I don't know if that's the way that everyone's feeling in this season. And uh, as a church, I want us to stay as healthy as possible, uh, both physically, but also emotionally and spiritually. And so to do that, there are two things I want to encourage us to do. Uh, the first is to name whatever it is you're feeling. It's okay to be thankful for a warm home and be frustrated that you have to do a conference call with a child in your lap. Uh, students, it's okay to feel glad that you don't have to get up early for school and also miss your friends. So first, to stay healthy, just be honest and name some of the things that you're feeling. Second, I want us in this season as a church to name what our focus is going to be. We don't know exactly how long this is going to last, and we don't yet know what all of the implications are, but we have the opportunity to experience the peace and the presence of God in crisis unlike in any other season. There are ways that God meets us when things are a little bit crazy, and there are things that he teaches us and ways that he shows himself to us that he can only do when things are in crisis. I'm a person who gets seasick easily, and anytime I'm on a boat and start to feel queasy, I get very similar advice. It's something like, you know, fix your eyes on the horizon. Look at the horizon. It doesn't change. Focus on that. And I think in a season where we might be a little seasick from all the change, we've got to focus on what doesn't change. We've got to find a way to keep our eyes fixed on God and on his word. And so I want to encourage you to name a verse that you are going to anchor on in this season. For me, I've been holding on to a scripture from Isaiah 41. It's verse 10, and it says this, So do not fear for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. This verse says, do not fear. And I've heard that word fear from some of you who have to walk into hospitals to do your job or fear of getting sick. And the scripture says that, that we don't have to fear because God is with us. He is actually by our side. He's close by. And so we can look for him to meet us. Uh, this passage also goes on to say, do not be dismayed. And that word dismayed in this context means uh, looking around in different directions because you're unsure of what to do. And maybe you find yourself dismayed, looking around a little bit lost, because all the great plans that you had for your senior year aren't going the way that you've planned. Or maybe you haven't been able to get together with the people that you love and, and you're feeling some dismay and some discouragement. God's voice in these verses here gets louder and he says, I am your God. I will strengthen and help you. I will hold you up with my right hand. God is saying, I'm going to hold you steady. I've got this. 
Fix your eyes on me. Keep your eyes on the horizon. I'm your God. I'm with you in this, and I will steady you in this. I have a wall in my house where I write uh, verses in Sharpie. Uh, kids, ask your parents before you do this at home. But I've written this verse from Isaiah on my wall, and it's one that I look at often these days. The words, do not fear, I'm with you. Do not be dismayed. I am your God. I'll strengthen you and help you. I'll uphold you with my righteous right hand. Those are words that I need to cling on. They are the horizon for me that I'm fixing my eyes on. So church, name what you're feeling and name your focus. Pick a verse, pick a scripture, and when you find yourself unsteady or anxious, read it, recite it, memorize it, maybe as a whole family, and I'm praying that God will use his word to keep our eyes fixed on him in this season. And I believe he's going to do a work in us that he can only do in a time like this. Before we go into worship, let's pray together. God, I pray that you would help us to recognize the ways that we're feeling right now. Help us to name them right now. And I'd encourage you wherever you are, either quietly or even out loud, just say what you're feeling out loud. God, I pray that you would meet us in whatever we are feeling right now. God, I pray that you would help us to anchor in your scripture, anchor in your words for us. God, I pray that we would not fear, that we would not be dismayed, but that we would cling to you and that you would reveal your presence to us. I pray that we would feel you uh, tangibly with us, giving us a peace uh, that doesn't really make sense, but can only come from you. God, would you meet us? Even as we worship you today, even as we hear your word today, God, would your spirit meet us wherever we're at in our homes and help us to set our eyes on you. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Church, let's get ready to worship together wherever we are. Uh, sing out loud and join us as we continue in worship. Mountains are still being moved. Strongholds are still being moved. can see that wonders are still what you do. Bodies are still being raised. Giants are still being slain. God, we believe. Yes, we can see wonders are still
God, even now you are moving within our midst, and we thank you for that. We sing praises to your name. Sing this out to him. Let our praise be your welcome. Let our songs be a sign. We are here for you. We are here for you. Yes, we are. Let your breath come from heaven. Fill our hearts. are open.
God, we thank you that there is no one like you. God, that um, in times of uncertainty where we feel like the world has been shaken, Father, that we can come to you and we can depend on you and your faithfulness and your goodness. That God, you are not stressed, that you do not feel anxiety regardless of what's happening around us, that you are a firm foundation. And so God, thank you for meeting us. Thank you for meeting us in our homes, whether we're sitting at a, at a dining room table or on the floor playing with a toddler or just snuggled up on our couch with the family. God, wherever it is that we are, we know that you are with us. And so thank you, Father. Thank you for showing up. Thank you for being present with us as we worship together this morning. 
It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now, if you're like me, maybe you're finding that you're getting a lot of extra screen time in these days. And so here's my question for you today. Whether you're sitting with family or if you're alone, feel free to put it in the chat. What show are you most likely to watch right now when you've got a little bit of downtime? What show are you watching? We'd love to hear what your suggestion is. Well, good morning, Willis Southlake. It has been a pleasure worshiping with you this morning while you were in your home. And I too, I am at home with my family. And so what I thought I might do is just have my family join me this morning. This is my lovely wife, Amanda, and she's gonna help tell you uh, some of the things that's happening in the life of our church during this season. So a lot of people wanna know, what is it that I can do in the midst of COVID-19 to help our community? So Willow South Lake is going to host a blood drive on Friday, April 3rd from 7.30 to one, and that will be at Willow South Lake. So there's more information in your e-news as well as the website wslathome.org. Yeah, and that's a reservation only serving opportunity. So if you're able to give blood in the season, please go look at that information and get signed up. Get yourself a slot there and that'll be really helpful for our community. Now, we've also heard from many of you saying, hey, since we're not meeting together on the weekends, how can we best give and support the mission of our church? One of the ways for you to give is through our website. You can go to willowsouthlake.org slash give and give digitally germ-free right there. But I know many of you still like to write checks and that's okay. Write out your check, drop it in an envelope, and then you can mail it to Willow South Lake at 625 Barclay Boulevard in Lincolnshire. And we are checking our mail regularly. So thank you for all the ways that you give so generously. Now, Amanda did mention that we have a website, wslathome.org. And on that website, you will find all kinds of content, whether you're adults like us or all the way down to our preschool or Beckett and anywhere in between. You can go there and you can find some engaging ways to interact with your family around what's happening in the life of our church. Now, there's some great things on there that's not just content. We also have forums where you can go and interact and engage with other people in our community, and that's gonna be a great time. So please go to the website, wslathome.org, and we would love to see you there. We also have Facebook and Instagram. Those are cranking right now as well in the season. And so please post away, and when you're posting in those platforms, tag us at Willow South Lake, or even use the hashtag wslathome so that we can all celebrate what God is doing together in this season. Yeah, so take your selfie and get ready as we join in with our South Barrington congregation as our interim senior pastor, Ray Johnston, teaches us this morning. Willow Creek, I'm happy to come from my living room into your living room or wherever you are. And to be honest with you, I'm actually entering this message very fired up. I just walked into this after leading a nationwide prayer meeting with the 85-year-old world-class evangelist Luis Palau. And I got to interview him as part of this prayer meeting. And I asked Luis this question, if you could say anything to Willow Creek right now, and if you could say anything to every single church in America right now, what would you say? And Luis, what, his response was instant. He said, I would tell people that our country has never been this afraid, and here's what I would say to every Christian in America. We have good news. That started me thinking. We're in the study in the Gospel of Mark. If I could ask Jesus what he would say to America, it's going to come up on the screen right now. I believe Jesus would say six words to every Christian in America, no matter what you're going through right now, and here they are. Let not your heart be troubled, which sounds easier than it is, because let's admit it, we're in the age of everybody's afraid of everything. We're in the age of everybody's hiding indoors. We're, we're, we were already in the age of anxiety. That has gone to sky high levels. And I want to set the stage for the message that I'm going to give you today, because a pastor told me, he said, look, here's the deal. He goes, 
All these sermons are online. He goes, we need to go shallow. We need to go lightweight, which like, you got, they got to be short. Like, it should be like three minutes long, and it should be like a poem and a joke and maybe make a point and a story, but that's it. People aren't going to pay attention. Well, I'm going to go counter that today um, because I believe we live in serious times, and I believe we have a God where there's hope and help available to every single one of you. So I'm going to come out swinging and I have eight points and I'm going to get through these things as fast as I can. But I actually believe this. It is possible. And America's number one need and your number one need is to have this possibility happen. I believe it is possible to drive fear and anxiety right out of our lives, even during these times. And I think it is America's number one need and your number one need and my number one need. So I actually have eight points. I'm going to dive into them. And here's what I want to say. Get them down as fast as you can. Live these things. Memorize some of these things. Get them into your soul. Um, get free from some of them. And if you need to watch this five times, watch this five times. Pass it on to whoever you think needs this thing. Because I actually believe this. Just because our times seem miserable doesn't mean God's people have to live lives of despair. In the words of Luis Palau, we have good news in the words of Jesus. Let not your heart be troubled. So I'm going to dive right into the subject of fear. The theme is stop running scared. And I want to give you two theological statements about fear. If you're going deep theology, cover to cover in the Bible, what's the Bible say about fear? Number one is this, fear is not from God. When I'm afraid, uh, it's not from God. How do you know that? Because Paul wrote crystal clear, God did not give us a spirit of fear or timidity, but of power, love, and discipline. In other words, if I'm filled with anxiety, that's not from God. If I'm filled with fear, that's not from God. If I'm filled with stress and despair, that is not from from God. God wants us living lives of power and love and self-discipline. He wants us living lives of positive forward action instead of being crippled and torn apart by our fears. Fear, number one, theologically, fear is not from God. Second, theologically, fear must be fought off. Fear must be fought off. For example, Isaiah said this, do not fear, for I am with you. Don't anxiously look around, for I am your God. And then he goes on and says, I will strengthen you, and I will uphold you, and I will help you with my victorious right hand. That was my favorite verse in college. It was my basketball verse. I said before I went into any game. Okay? Now, what does he mean by that? Do not fear is the most common greeting in the Bible. For example, okay, Joshua is getting ready to cross the Jordan River and go to a new place. What does he say? Do not fear. To Zechariah, do not be terrified. Go to the Gospels. We're going to study the Gospel of Mark. First thing the angel says to Joseph, don't fear. First thing the angel says to Mary, don't fear. The first thing the angel say to the shepherds, don't fear. The first thing the angel said on Easter to the women, don't fear. The first thing they say, Jesus says, it's Easter Sunday morning. The disciples are terrified. Jesus breaks into a room. They're locked in and says, do not fear. The Bible says, fear not. 366 times, okay? There's one for every single day. Now, why fight fear? Because fear damages us in four ways. And the Bible makes crystal clear, fear will cripple you and I in four ways, and here they are. Number one, fear paralyzes potential. It's a, the disciples were in a room locked for fear of the third. It, fear, here's what happens. Do you lock a door from the inside or the outside? You always lock a door from the inside, okay? And fear, when fear locks the door, it locks in worry. It locks in anxiety. It locks in discouragement. It locks in depression. And it locks out all the possibilities for every great thing that happens in the future. There are people that will never fulfill their God-given potential just because they wasted their entire life being locked in a prison of fear and insecurity. God's got better days than that ahead for you. Number one, fear paralyzes potential. The second thing fear does is this. It obliterates joy. It obliterates joy. David said this, I am worn out by my worries. Let me ask you point blank. Is David the only one? You ever been worn out by your worries? You're like going, I can't sleep. I'm stressed out. I'm just worn out, not because I'm too busy, but because I'm too stressed. I'm just worn out. A friend of mine said this, more people are worn out by worry than work because more people 
worry than work. That's a great line. Fear paralyzes potential. Fear obliterates joy. Third is this, fear sabotages success. It sabotages six. Fear will rob you of every good thing that could be in your future. Check this out. Everything I fear and dread comes through. Psychologist Paul Tournier said this, fear actually creates what it fears, okay? The fear that I might not get a job stops me from applying for a job, so actually fear stops me from getting a job. The fear that I might not get a date stops me from Ask my wife's in here. The fear that it took me a long time to overcome fear to ask somebody as spectacular as my wife to go on a date. The fear that I, she might say no and reject me almost robbed me of 38 years of marriage to my best friend. Fear paralyzes potential, it obliterates joy, it sabotages success, and fear eliminates adventure. It turns your life into an the complete lack of adventure and the entire life playing it safe. He says, I was afraid and I went and hid. Fear is the inner condition. It's the motion, went and hide. That's what helps. And then I bury my talent in the ground, which means God gives me one spectacular life, only one shot. And I get a chance to really live it or play safe and lock myself in fear. I will spend all of eternity celebrating or regretting the lifestyle option I took on that one. Um, the Folks, it was fear that kept the children of Israel out of the promised land. It cost them their future. It was fear that caused this guy to bury his talent and to never fulfill his God-given potential in his time on earth. It was fear that locked the disciples into a room of misery after Jesus was already alive. Uh, we have a definition of fear that we use it based on. I should write a book on this sometime. Here it is. Fear is the dark room where negatives develop. I'll pause while everybody writes that down. Fear is the dark room where negatives develop. Fear is the dark room where worry develops. Fear is the dark room where anxiety develops. Fear is the dark room where discouragement develops. Fear is the dark room where despair develops. And the rest of this message I just want to ask one question. I believe this is my number one need. I believe it's your number one need, and I wish everybody in America could hear this. I believe this is every single person in America's number one need, and here it is. How do I drive fear and stress and anxiety and despair? How do I drive that out of my life and replace it with healthy emotions? How do I, how do I drive fear out of my life? We are in a series at Willow on the Gospel of Mark. And two things in the Gospel of Mark that Jesus did over and over and over again have the power and potential to drive fear right out of my life. And if you got a pen, write these down. Some of you may want to watch this five times just to get these things, and it will take you a lifetime to unpack the implications of these. But here they are. Question number one, how do you drive fear out of my life? Number one thing running all the way through every gospel on the gospel of Mark is this, and it's going to sound weird when I first put it up. Number one is accept the love God has for you. Accept the love God has. Some of you listen to me going, oh, come on, Ray. This is deeper than this. Just accept the love God has for you, and all of a sudden, everything's rosy. It sounds so shallow. It sounds so trite. It sounds like the kind of thing a pastor would say without thinking at deeper levels. What does love have to do with fear? What do those things have to do with each other? And the best description of that was written by the the Apostle John. He said this, there is no fear in love. And here's the phrase, perfect love casts out fear. Perfect love casts out fear. Now, what does fear have to do with casting? what What does love have to do with casting out fear? Best way to describe it is to go a little bit deeper in this message. And here we go. There are three sources. Three kinds of fear. Fear wells up in your life from one of three places. The first is this, surface fears. And those are shallow. They're a little easier to deal with. That's like, I'm afraid I can't pay the bills. I'm afraid I'll get a speeding ticket. I'm afraid I'll run out of gas. I'm afraid I'll get shop caught shopping at Kmart. I'm afraid we'll run out of toilet paper. Okay, there's some surface fears. They come, they go, they make you miserable three minutes, that sort of thing. Now, there's a way deeper level. And this is, it's subconscious fears. 
And those things are deep and they're rooted and a lot of times we are unaware and they drive us without us knowing it and they make us miserable without us realizing why. And it's things like, the, it's like the fear of failure, uh, the fear of rejection, the fear of abandonment, the fear of losing control, the fear of loneliness, which a lot of people are feeling right now during this time of social isolation. These, these subconscious fears, they lurk below the surface and they really make us miserable and they control us in ways we don't know are there. However, that's not the deepest level. You read through the Gospel of Mark, you discover there is a deeper need I have and a deeper level. And here it is. And it's the, here it is. It's soul fears. And that's the deepest one. It's the source. It's the taproot. And no matter how effectively I try to deal, I can read every self-help book in the world and not get cleared of this fear because until I deal with those soul fears, I'm going to be ineffective at getting relief and dealing with the first two of those things. It's really, because it's really about asking one question. What's my deepest need. My deepest need's for toilet paper. Now, what's my real deepest need? And here it is. My deepest need and your deepest need, and anybody that has courage enough to take a look at this will deal with it. My deepest need is to be unconditionally loved. My deepest need is to be unconditionally loved. I did not have that in my childhood. Okay? I had a really great dad for a while, and then he became an alcoholic, rageaholic. My mom became an alcoholic, and it was crazy time in my house, and none of the three kids, I was the oldest, none of the three kids ever felt safe in my house. I mean, the first thing you had to do when you got into my house was to go find dad, find out if he was drinking, find out if he was on a rageaholic binge, and off it went. So I grew up walking into a house very carefully and just kind of looking around. I had no idea, no idea what unconditional love felt like, like none. And then I encountered Jesus Christ and some Christians that took me on a journey because what I realized is this, I had to get my soul fears healed. I needed to have my relationship with God healed. I needed to have really my view of God and my view of myself needed to be healed or I was going to be ineffective at dealing with this ever for two reasons. Number one is this. Read through the Gospels. Read through the entire Bible. Frankly, let's admit it. Only God can love you as much as you need to be loved. Only God can love you as much as you need to be loved. And I have good news for you. He has loved you every second of every minute of every day. He made you. He knit you together. He has celebrated you. If God has a refrigerator, your picture's on it. If he's got a wallet, your picture's in it. God is flat out in love with you. And so you go, wait, wait, wait a second. I, I'm not a pastor. I'm not a worship leader. I'm not named Matt. I'm not that sharp. And Or man, you don't know what I've done. Or you know those kind of stuff. In other words, God's got sort of A-level people, and then I'm in the Z section, and he doesn't love me. I, I'm not in the luxury box. I'm in the nosebleed seats. The, um, that's where the gospel of Mark unpacks this. I mean, you realize, you look at this, Mark chapter 5, you have a demon-possessed man, and all of a sudden, he discovers he is loved and transformed by Jesus, the most unlikely character. Another one you got is this. You have a Greek woman, and sort of, they would have thought she was religiously on the outs, and all of a sudden, She goes to Jesus, and she not only discovers she's loved, she discovers that her sick daughter is loved by Jesus, and the transforming power of Jesus, because of his love, can actually work in her family, okay? 4,000 people are listening to Jesus, and all of a sudden, they're hungry. And they discover that Jesus cares about every need they have, not just words, but cares about their own hunger, and takes care of them. And when we started our church Bayside, we just started, we decided we'd try to start a church for people that don't like church. And we have been flooded with people and every person that walks into that place, uh, I am going, they are convinced they are not on God's God's plan A list. We finally put a sign out in front of our church, a massive sign in front of our church and left it up there for about six months. And here's what the sign said, okay? Everyone's welcome. Nobody's perfect. Anything's possible. Read the Gospel of Mark. You know what you discover? Cover to cover. Here it is. Everyone's welcome. You have not walked away from God so far. You can't walk back. Everyone's welcome. Nobody's perfect. And anything's possible. 
And you look at that and you're going, man, when I accept the love God has for me, I realize, number one, only God can love me as much as I need to be loved. Let me unpack that one step deeper. That means this. And this is why so many people are in relational casualty or they hop from relationship to relationship or trend to trend or whatever it is. And here it is. If I try to get from other people the love that only God can give me, I am going to be disappointed my entire life. I'll be limited my entire life. And that means this. If I never get to know God's love or if I just have some cold religious belief about a stained glass God, or if I've drifted away from a close relationship with God, I will be limited for the rest of my life because what will happen is this. It will create, if, if I don't have a close relationship with God, it creates a gigantic gaping hole in my life. And that hole, if I try to fill it with other people, I end up disappointed every time and break the relationships. Or if I try to fill that with other, if I have a gaping hole, it gets filled with the toxic emotions of fear and worry and anxiety and stress. The starting point, the starting point to letting go of fear is to go to the deepest level and develop an unconditional love relationship with Jesus and let him backwash that up into your life and you finally end up freed and you can walk out of the prison of fear you've been in. Number one, it starts with this. What's my deepest need? Unconditionally loved by God. I start by accepting the love God has for me. Second is this. The other thing running through the Gospels is this. The second thing is this. Then I saturate my mind with God's truth. I saturate my mind with God's truth. Uh, Jesus put it this way. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. You will know the truth, and it's the truth that can set me free about fear. Maybe the best way to put it is this. When you're a kid, you know, you're kind of waiting. Sorry, come as your kids are watching your living room. You're going, I'm scared at night. I see these shadows at night. I'm just kind of freaking out, laying on my bed. And you go, what do you do to get rid of that fear? Pretty easy. You just go over, and you turn on a light. And all the minute the light comes on, all of a sudden you realize, hey, I had nothing to worry about. You know what we need right now? Church, the best thing we could do for ourselves or America is just to turn on the light. I'll give you an example of that. It's kind of embarrassing. Um, we live in Northern California. We had two copycat two suicides of teenagers in Northern California. And people came to me, and I was traveling, writing, and speaking, and I did not want to be a pastor because I was afraid to be a pastor. And some people came to me and said, we need to start a church. Would you start a church? So we start a church uh, for people that don't like church, called it Bayside. Okay? And it starts to grow and grow and grow. So we buy land in Granite Bay. Granite Bay is the suburbs of, um, of Sacramento. It's pretty wealthy. A lot of outstanding people live here. Uh, it is fairly uniform in terms of upper middle class to upper class people. And we start this church and then we buy land and we're going to build a building. We go in to get permission. And this, now I live in California where somebody's against everything. And so a little tiny group of residents rose up and they decided they were going to stop our church from getting built. And they banded together and it wasn't, it wasn't very many people, but I tell you what, they were determined and some of them were vicious. And we had people get threats. We had to move people out of our house. I had to have private security. We would have security cars in front of my house. I mean, all these threats were rolling. It was, it was so crazy. I pull up to church one Sunday morning. We're meeting at a high school. Had about four services at the high school. Had about 4,000 people. Pull up, and th this little group of people, they are in the parking lot with picketing. They are picketing our church. Okay? And it's things like, save Granite Bay. You know, that, that sign, which is why we started the church. And so they're picketing our church. And... I saw that and I thought, this is a great chance for our church to learn to be the church. Because what does the Bible say we're supposed to do with our enemies and opponents? We are supposed to? Yeah, absolutely. Love them. It was a cold morning, so we brought them hot coffee and donuts all morning long. It started raining and got real miserable. We brought them umbrellas out for everybody there. They were passing out stuff. We said, look, if you're so miserable, we will put this in our programs and give it to everybody to read if you'd like. And I'll never forget this. One of the opponents came into my office and he said to me, look, the reason I'm against this, he basically came in to talk me into getting our church out of Granite Bay. And he looked right at me and he said, the reason I want your church out of Granite Bay is nothing in Granite Bay other than Folsom Lake should attract those outsiders, which is a code word. 
And I literally, he left my office, and I don't know if he realized it. He lit a fire in me. I got down on my knees and my carpet, and I just started praying. I said, God, I am recommitting myself to this to you, and we will get this because we have never paid any attention to anybody's race or address or economic condition before they walked into our church, and we are not about to start now. And so these picketers continued. All the stuff got crazy, and it took about three years. And this one lady, I'll never forget, this one lady looked at me and she said, it'll be a cold day in hell before you get that church built. In the midst of this, and this is embarrassing because I'm supposed to be preaching you a a message on how to live stress-free. I'm stressed out. I'm having trouble sleeping. I am worried about my family. I am tossing and turning at night. I was not happy. Maybe some of you can identify with this recently. And while I'm going on that, I literally went, I need something to get me through this. And you know what I needed to do? I needed to saturate my mind with God's truth. I just went, I need a promise from God that will get me through it. And I found it in the book of Nehemiah, in the second chapter of the book of Nehemiah. It transformed my emotions. You can check that out with my wife. It transformed me from the inside out. And the verse, Nehemiah chapter 2, said this, the God of heaven will give us success we, his servants, will arise and build. And I literally want the God of heaven to give us success. We, his servants, will arise and build. I put that on my mirror. I put it in my shower. I put it everywhere I could. I said it morning, noon, and night, and I slept better. I lived relatively stress-free. The fog lifted. The doors flew open. I walked out of the prison of fear and discouragement, and I had an incredible, about three years, saying that verse all the time, every day, that promise of God lifted me right out of the pit of fear and discouragement and it kept me going. And when that lady said to me, it'll be a cold day in hell before you ever build this church at Granite Bay, it must be a cold day in hell because we've been meeting there for 10 years and have thousands and thousands of people from our community coming to that church. I'm here to tell you folks, there is nothing like flooding your life with the promises of God. You and I are going to panic or we're going to pray during this next season. And at some point, we've got to pick how we want to live because it will have an end result. And to wrap this up, here's what I want to do. I want to show you these two things together. How do you drive fear out of your life? You have to go deep. Shallow stuff these days doesn't cut it. Number one, I've got to accept the love God has for me. In other words, connect with the love of God at a deep level. And second is, I've got to saturate my mind with God's truth. Or if you want to put it with a little more theology, here it is. On this one, accepting the love that God has for you, that's the presence of God. Saturating your mind with God's truth, that's the promise of God. And Willow Creek and everybody listening, moms, dads, all of you, I just want to say this. If you will receive the love God has for you, and then you will get into your Bible and into these studies and the journey devotional, get it and use it every single day. If you will do these two things, this will be, you hook the live wires together of the presence of God and the promises of God. And when you hook the presence of God and the promises of God, and then you will have the power of God unleashed in your life. Why would you want to live any other way? Let's pray together. Would you bow your heads, unless you're driving, would you bow your heads and pray with me if this is what you need? If you join us this weekend, we're really glad you're here. We love God, and we love you, and we love unleashing compassion to the entire community and world. And But it all starts with this, accepting the love God has for me. And what I want to say right now is this. If you're listening to this and you're going, man, this is exactly what I need. I need God's forgiveness. I need God's grace. I need a relationship with God. I need a love relationship with God. I I know about God. I need to know God. I need Christ in my life. I need the presence and promises of God, unleashing the power of God in my life. I'm going to pray a prayer of commitment, and that could happen to you right now. So if this is what you need, if you're going, I need a clean slate, I need a fresh start, I need Christ in my life, pray with me right now, would you? Let's pray together. I'll pray out loud, pray with me silently if you want, but let's pray. Lord Jesus, I believe you died on a cross and rose, which means you're alive and you're right here with me. So right now, I ask you to forgive me for all my sins 
I let the past go forever. Jesus Christ, I receive you today. Come into my life. Be my Savior. And I commit myself to you. Be my Lord. Thank you for your love. Make me a brand new person. And God, I am very grateful today. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, it was so good to worship with you virtually today. Now, before you go on with the rest of your day, I want to encourage you, go to our website, wslathome.org, and check out the Serve tab. There are two specific ways to serve our local community that basically expired this week. The first is that we know that there is a critical blood shortage, and so we are hosting a blood drive at our church this Friday, April 3rd, and we want to fill up every single spot. So go online and get signed up for that. Second, our local food pantry tells us that they have some specific needs around meals with protein, things like tuna and soups. Uh, they have needs around cleaning supplies and toiletries. And so please, as you're going out shopping and picking up things for your family, grab some of those items and our church main entrance vestibule will be open between 9 a.m. and 9 p.m. today and tomorrow for you to drop off those items in bins and we'll make sure they get to the food pantry. Uh, finally, middle school and high school students, your groups, your small groups meet later today. You can go to the website, wslathome.org, and find out the times and ways to access those groups. Families, you can also find activities to do with your kids today, so I'd encourage you to check that out. If there's anything that we can do to support you during this time, we want to know, so please reach out, and we would love to serve you. Good to be with you this morning, and we will see you next weekend.